So, hello everyone. Uh, I see that we are, we are around 12 at the moment, so everyone should be, should be around. So, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Fabrice Cordelier, and I'm going to uh, give you a, a quick overview at what you can do with the images that you're acquiring uh, on the BIC. Uh, to, to see what you can do with the images. So um, basically, uh, this lecture will be uh, split in, in two, in three, in fact. The first part will be, uh, we will see how we can open the images, make few manipulations in order to uh, have a nice picture at the end, the kind of picture that you will be able to include in your report. And uh, tomorrow we'll see a few hints at how to analyze uh, images, uh, how to count objects, how to uh, maybe tweak a bit the images in order to make them uh, better for the analysis, to, to make the, anal the, the analysis process a bit, uh, a bit easier. So from what I understand, uh, some of you have already followed one lecture as part of the cancer biology um, uh, curriculum, if I well understand. So do not hesitate to say if you were part of the students of the uh, cancer biology uh, curriculum. Let's see. So there is a little lag between what I'm saying and the, what, what is broad broadcasted on, on YouTube maybe a few, few seconds. So do not hesitate to uh, use the chat first to tell me if you were, if you've been following the image lecture. Uh, and second, do not hesitate to put questions in the, in the, in the chat so that I can answer. So I give you a few, few seconds to maybe say, okay, I was part of the cancer biology stuff. Are not part of the concern. Okay. 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 Anyway, if uh, you want to, for people in the physics uh, track, if you want to have a look at what we did as part of the other module, do not hesitate to to go. There is a uh, there is a video on on, uh, on my uh, channel. Okay. Okay, so there will be part of an overlap with what we did, but you will see this is not at all the same. The, 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 the lecture is not organized the same way. So, first of all, the thing we will, uh, we will do is we will try to think a bit about what an image is. Because overall, we, we will be uh, working on images. So, the first step is surely to know what an image is. Okay, and so instead of playing with uh, some kind of fancy software to do some drawings live, I did prefer to go back to the analogical stuff. So you see pen, paper. So first of all, um, an image is just a way to uh, capture and present a scene. So the scene might be, uh, let's say, a tree, and you will see that I'm quite good at drawing. Uh, it might be sun, etc. So this is real life. This is your scene. And what you will do, you will use a detector in order to, um, to, to sample this scene. Something will be done in two ways. First way, spatially. So instead of having all, all possible little things on the scene, you will make some blocks. And depending on the size of the blocks, of course, you won't have exactly the same resolution on your, on your image. And of course, uh, I'm pretty sure that people on the, on the big have been uh, explaining you about the Shannon Nyquist theory 
that allows you to really make uh, the expected resolution of your uh, of your system fit with the resolution you will you will get on the image. So first, you will do the sampling in space. And then the thing you will do for each of the element, for each of the sample, you will quantify quantify something which could be the amount of light or, or maybe the amount of light but for a certain wavelengths. And so selecting the wavelengths is something that you will do using filters, for instance. Uh, whereas here, you you don't make any uh, any particular selection. But anyway, you will do a second type of sampling, a sampling that is related to uh, intensities. At the end, in fact, each element of your image or pixel for picture element will have three coordinates which are its position in X, in Y, and a certain intensity. Okay. When dealing with the intensity, um, of course, you won't be able to replicate the, all the intensities that you would find in a natural thin or in a, in, in a, in a microscopy uh, view. So, what you will have to do is quantify that relative to a certain scale. Um, basically, oh, let's imagine that I draw a line across this part of the scene and plot along the line the real intensity you would have you would surely have something like that where all the possible values are are, are available but unfortunately as we are we we expect to work with a computer uh, all the values can't be replicated on the image so you will have to quantify relative to a scale uh, this scale will have a maximum and a minimum and we are uh, due to the, to the way the intensities are encoded by the computer the maximum will always be a power of two so it can be the maximum could be two to the power of eight two to the power of 16 and there are other additional scales that are available what is the difference between uh, the, the two scales, so the 8-bit scale and the 16-bit scale? The main difference will be the total number of steps you will have uh, along the, the scale. With 2 to the power of 8, intensities can range from 0 to 255 whereas the intensities on the 16-bit scale can range from 0 to 65,535. So you see you've got few steps and really more steps here. And as a consequence, of course, um, the quantitation that you will do won't be exactly the same from one, uh, depending on which type of scale you're using. If you're using an 8-bit scale and you've got this part, this intensity, this intensity is closer to the first step in 8-bit. This this intensity is closer to that one, that one to the max, etc. And so if I draw it roughly, what you will get is, oops, sorry, is 
roughly something like that. I hope you can see it well on the video. So with, with a certain scale that has not that many levels, you will have a rough um, um, estimation of the intensities, a, a rough um, overview of, of your a roof, uh, quantitation of your intensities. Whereas if you have many scales, you will be able to go more into, into details, make higher differences between all the possible uh, of your possible intensities, of your capture in the intensities. You see, see the difference? So this is not a perfect drawing. This is just to give you an idea about what you will get at the end of uh, when taking the picture. So, of course, if you have a signal that is, let's say, in reality, something like this, 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 and that, you would rather go for an 8-bit scale, which will be enough for what you want to do. If, to the contrary, if you have subtle differences that you want to document, therefore you would need to use rather a 16-bit scale in order to not to lose all the, the possible uh, the, uh, tiny differences that you may you may have on your on your microscopy scene. Do we have questions so far? I let you maybe five seconds. Maybe this is a good opportunity to uh, recheck the green screen. Okay. okay. No questions so far. So an image is a double computation, a double, so, sorry, a double sampling. You will make blocks in space and for, for, <laughs> okay, thanks for the comment. Um, you will have blocks in space. And once you have blocks in space, you will quantitate the signal relative to a scale you will have to choose between 8 bits and 16 bits. Okay. Of course, when I've got tiny details like when I have rough details like that, of course, this could fit in a 16 bit scale. The main issue will be it will take more space on your hard disk drive without giving you more information. So uh, there is, if you're unsure, just go for the biggest scale. But, well, if you know precisely that you don't have many details about your image in terms of intensities, just go for the one that will not uh, fill your hard disk drive. Okay, once the image is acquired, the thing you need to do is to store the image. And to do that, you will use a file format. And I will tell you a bit about file format. A file is, is simply a container where you will put your data. And then, of course, if you've got a container and you want to uh, review the data and uh, uh, be able to, uh, to, to, to use it, you must make some decisions about how to organize the container. And in general, when talking about images, the file, the container is organized in two parts. One part that is called metadata, and one part 
that will contain the image information. In metadata, you will store all the things that are related to, uh, let's say, uh, the size of your image. This could be part of the metadata. The sampling. Uh, this could be um, the scale. So one pixel equals how many micrometers this, this is part of the metadata. If you're working on the time series, you could have the, the time delay between two images. This could be part of the metadata. Then on the image part, you could simply, knowing that you've got the size in the metadata, you could simply store all the intensities uh, in one row. So, one, two, one, three, four, etc. All the quantitations that you've done previously could be stored like, like that. This is one way to store the data. Well, if I take some kind of sequence, and especially when working with fluorescent, fluorescent I I I images, what you will see is you've got a lot of zeros, which corresponds to background or a similar value that is higher than zero, but which is almost a constant. Then you may have a bit of signal. Etc, etc. Or you may have something like, to take an easier example, you could have a line like that. Or you may have a line like like that. Well, you see that having a lot of black in, in the image, uh, you will have to encode in this part of the image, in the, in the image block of your container, you will have to write a lot of values that are similar. So one way to, to tweak the way you store the data is to use compression. Uh, so you will use compression. And after that, you will have to use, uh, when you want to read the image, decompression. You will have to use a codec, a certain way to compress and decompress your data. And I will show you two ways to do it. The first way is, is called run length encoding. And to do that, you will say, okay, I've got four times zero, then four times one, then three times two, then two times three. So of course, on a short sequence like that, you don't get any benefit, but on larger scale, you will see that you will, you will be able to compress quite well. This sequence will take less space as compared to that one. So you will end up with, with exactly the same sentence, exactly the same message, except that that one will take less space as compared to that one. So this is one way to compress. And you see that you can unpack the data quite easily. To go, to go back to the ori original message, meaning that this compression is non-destructive. Another way to, to change, to compress the message would be to find some sequences that are repeated. Like, okay, zero, zero could be one sequence. One, two, three could be one sequence. 4, 5, 6 could be another sequence. In that case, I would attribute, let's say, one letter to each sequence. And this way, I would have a really shorter sequence. But in order to be able to decompress, 
I should add what is called a dictionary in order to, to get back to the original message. Of course, on a one sentence message, this is, this is not that efficient. But on a bigger scale, when you've got more data, this would be quite, quite efficient. So these two methods, there are two types of codecs. So compression, decompression, that are uh, non-destructive. And this is important, especially when working on, uh, on microscopy images, that you keep as much as possible the uh, original data. You may, uh, this kind of thing is used in zip, for instance. This is not exactly like that, but this is, this is quite similar. You may have heard about uh, other ways uh, to compress the data. You may have heard about JPEG, which is in fact for joint photographs, experts, group. And in fact, this photographs came up, came up with a, a way to heavily compress the data. The first thing they do is divide the image into blocks where they, they will smooth the intensities. By smoothing the intensities in each block, you will have relatively the same intensity over the block, which makes it easier then to compress when, with one of the two methods there. But of course, by smoothing the intensities locally, you will lose part of the information. This is why JPEG is not something to use in microscopy unless really at the end of the process when you want to send the image to a colleague. Uh, the thing we will rather use is the file format from the microscope people, from the, the manufacturer of the, of the microscope, and you've got plenty of file, uh, file formats that keep all the, all the information. Uh, you can also save as TIFF, but be careful with TIFF uh, because sometimes the data could be compressed and compressed as JPEG. So it's not because you see a TIFF extension in your file that it hasn't been compressed in JPEG. An additional point, um, once you have saved as JPEG, even if you're converting back to TIFF, you have lost the data. So there is no way you can come back to the original uh, data once you have crushed the, the data using, for instance, JPEG compression. Is it okay for everyone? So I leave you a few seconds to to say, yeah, okay or no. Uh, so the question is, what did you mean by sampling in metadata? <laughs> uh, well, sampling in the metadata is more, uh, I shouldn't have put this like that, but resolution. And in fact, resolution is a word when dealing with the image that is not really uh, well um, it's not appropriate because resolution in general is, is expressed like a number of dot per inch. This is the expected um, resolution at which you're supposed to print the image by putting 72 dots per inch. So of course, uh, okay, well, Let's say that this is your image and it's expected to be printed at 72 dots per inch. If you want to uh, print it at 300 dots 
per inch. The thing you will do is simply print the same, exactly the same data, but over a, sh a smaller uh, surface. Okay. Okay, so nice question. So um, when working with di dictionary uh, for very long messages, does the library not risk taking up the space? We want, uh, I, I could do it that way. Okay, so uh, for long messages, does the library not risk taking up the space we want to save? Yes. Yes, this this is a risk, especially if you've got noisy data. This is a this is a high risk, but if you've got something that is uh, with low noise, low background, low uh, low variability, and repetitive motifs, this may work. This is typically what is uh, used when you deal with the GIF file format, that is especially well done for for the web and so on. Uh, to be honest, for microscopy, well, uh, rather use zip than directly this, this kind of stuff where really the, the way the dictionary is optimized to shorten everything. Okay. Do you have additional questions? Okay. So, if you don't have any additional question, then I think it is time to open Fiji software. I hope that you all have been uh, downloading the Fiji software. We will start it. And I hope that you all have been uh, downloading the images. So uh, from time to time, your Fiji will ask you if you want to update it. So depending on uh, if you've got time or not, this could be worth clicking on OK. For now, I will simply close the window, especially because when updating, you will need to restart the, the software. Okay. Now, we will go to images. You will have plenty of, uh, of images in there and we will go here in activity number two manipulations of images and you may have a subfolder with uh, opening simple images in this folder, you will see that you've got sets of images. You've got three images that start with the same radical and three images with another radical. The thing I will do is I will select the three first images. And now I will drag them onto image toolbar. Maybe just a few words about image and anatomy. So this is the image toolbar. On a PC, you would have uh, all the menus attached to the bar. With a Mac, you see that all the menus are on the top here. So this will be a slight difference between maybe me and, and, and so, some of you. You have the menu, you have the tools, here that we will be using especially tomorrow when dealing with the measurements. And you see that here you've got an additional 
part of the of the toolbar that is uh, the status bar so it's a way for image to communicate with you so for instance when i go over each icon i will have the name of the tool that i'm pointing at and sometimes i will have some hints about additional uh, functions so the thing i will do is take the three images there drag them and drag them ah oops not double click on it i will drag them onto onto the toolbar and you see that in the status bar it has detected a drag and drop and it's writing it in in this famous status bar okay so now i've got three images and as you can see my screen is quite uh, is, a, is a bit small so the three images have been open but i can't see them because they are one on top of the other and there is one trick which consists in get, going to window and tile and by doing that it will automatically adapt the zoom and dispose of the images side by side which it did Is it okay for everyone? Okay. So if you look at one image, you have a status bar as well for each single image. In this status bar, you will have the size in pixels for your image then here you have the depth of your image so on which type of scale you've been working so here the the expected maximum intensity maximum possible intensity will be 65535 and you have here the size of your image of the imprint of your image in the computer's memory. Uh, I told you, and if I go back, yeah, I told you that in fact, each picture element, each pixels has three coordinates, X, Y, and the intensity. And if I go back here, on one image, and if I look at what's going on in the status bar here, when I go over the image, I will see that indeed, I've got three coordinates. So the X, the Y, and the value, the intensity. If I go to the background, I will see that I've got values that are not zero, although they are printed on the screen as black. And if I go over the signal, I've got a higher intensity. Okay. This is important to have this in mind that the background on the fluorescent image will be lowest intensity and highest intensities uh, are the ones corresponding to, to the signal. And one way we, we could uh, we could have a look, have a, a better look at the distribution of intensities would be, for instance, to get the histogram of the image. To get the histogram, um, you would go to analyze and histogram or simply press the H key. So, what is a histogram? A histogram is simply getting uh, the minimum and all possible intensities over this image, the minimum, the maximum, all possible intensities, and for each possible intensity over the image, counting the number of pixels carrying this intensity. This in Y is 
the number of pixels carrying a certain intensity. And here I've got the range, the possible, the, the full range of intensity that I've got on, on, on the image. I see a big peak and then this bump, which tells me that for sure I've got two types of population of populations of the image. I've got the low intensity pixels and I've got a bit higher intensity uh, pixels. Um, to your opinion, is it is it normal to have does this histogram reflect the image? And what what is this big peak? And what is the bump afterwards? I'm curious to see what you think uh, in the, in the comments. So I definitely should add a bit of music in this kind of time because we've got roughly between five and ten seconds lag between you and me. The big peak represents the amount of pixel that consists constitutes the background. Yeah. And then the bump. Yeah. Some elevator music could do in this kind of situation. Oh. Okay. The map are the uh, bright, brighter pixels. True. And you know what? Even if we are at the step where we are dealing with the display of the images, we will do a bit of uh, analysis. So I see that I've got, uh, I've got several good answers. Good. Okay. There is one thing on this histogram window that is quite useful. This is a live mode. Just press live so that the button becomes red. You see that it doesn't make any difference about the histogram except from this button that became red. Now you can uh, use a rectangular tool and this rectangular tool, I could draw a big rectangle over the image. I've made a selection over the image and now the histogram is the histogram only of that precise selection. All the little uh, uh, squares, white squares here are handles that allow me to resize the, the 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 selection. If I want to move the selection, I've got to click inside the selection. You see, outside I've got a cross, inside I've got the arrow. And if I press and move, I move the selection. And you see that the histogram is updating accordingly. So now, the thing I could do to verify that the peak was indeed background is make a small selection and put it over background. And indeed, I've got a peak, a low intensity peak. If I move over the cell, I've got not only one bump, but maybe several little bumps, but they, they, they were hidden by this big peak when I had the full picture uh, on the histogram. And the thing I could do is I could make the rectangle half, half, half on the background and half on the cell. And you see that I get back the original shape that I had over the full image. And now the thing I can do is have a look at the histogram. When I'm progressively sliding over the background, I see that there is the first peak and progressively going over the cell from the background. Yeah, I see that I've got mainly the bump. So this is one way, one really simple way to identify what the different populations are 
over the, the image. Okay. Now, if you have a look, if you have a look at what's going on here, you see that you also have this gray scale there. This gray, gray scale, which depending on the content of your image, for instance, if I encompass this big bright spot, you see that this gray scale has changed. And here I've got white uh, really well visible. So in fact, what this gray scale tells me is that 433 intensity is represented as really dark. In between, you've got grayscale. And when you're going close to 2,205 uh, as an intensity, you get uh, it's displayed really, really bright. So if we click on the first image here, size 3, and now if we do the histogram, I will close this histogram because I don't need it anymore. So analyze histogram. If I go to live and now make this rectangular selection, I've got background, I've got intense cell, and here, yeah, I've got a low intensity cell here, which in fact, if I increase the size of my region of interest, from there where I had only a bit of background and a lot of signal, when increasing the size, I see that I've got a new populations, a new population here that is appearing, which is the medium intensity or really low intensity uh, signal there. So I barely see it. So the question is, how could I do to see it because the signal is there, but it's not well displayed. So I must tweak a bit the way I'm displaying the data. And to do this, I will use a box, uh, a, a specific tool in image. But before doing it, I will explain to you what is a color table. OK. On an image, what you've got, you've got intensities encoded, encoded in, uh, in the file. And you've got intensities on display. The general rule will be to find the minimum intensity in the file, to find the maximum intensity in the file, and then the minimum intensities, the intensity will be displayed in black. The maximum intensity will be displayed in white. And in between the two intensities, you will simply linearly distribute the intensities so that for instance, the midpoint will end up displayed as mid gray. So now let's imagine that you've got a lot of background. You've got a bit of signal. And you've got a high intensity, a lot of pixels that have a high intensity.
what you will see is all this all those intensities here will be represented as dark gray so you won't be able to see it and the maximum will be displayed as white so you will see it you will see it really well but you will hide part of the information here so one way to uh, to try to see what's going on on low intensity levels will be to try and redefine your maximum. This is a new maximum. If you define it as new maximum, then this is this value that will be displayed as white. Meaning that this will 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 be uh, displayed uh, in this first range between black and mid uh, gray of course you can't go over white meaning that all the values above will be displayed with the same intensity over the image meaning white okay So, to do that, to play a bit with the display, we could go to Image, Adjust, Brightness and Contrast. And here, you will see exactly so image, adjust, brightness and contrast. On this box, you will see exactly what I've been drawing previously. In that box, you've got the range of intensities that are stored onto the image. You've got the histogram. And you've got, let's say here, you've got your scale between the display between black and white here and the line that describes how you spread how do you distribute uh the display depending on the intensity you've got intensities you've got in the file so now if i play with the maximum as i move it down i will progressively make all the pixels carrying an intensity be, be, uh, above 1,400, all those intensities will be presented as white over the image, which gives me a lot of saturation. But as I'm saturating the high intensity uh, pixels, I'm starting to see the two dim cells here and here. Can we see if we have a saturation with the histogram? Good, good question. Can we see if we have saturation with the histogram? Yeah. Um, so saturation on the acquisition part uh, will be will be seen on the histogram at, with one peak really at the end of the range of uh, the, the histogram. So if the last part of the histogram is one peak where all the intensities are stuck, you have saturation. Okay, so the thing is, when I'm doing this, I'm not saturating the histogram. I'm not saturating uh, the raw intensities. I'm saturating the display, not the original data. Look, if I was saturating, uh, especially in this area, when moving from one pixel to another, the value that is displayed on the top here in the status bar, this value should be the same for everyone, except that here we kept the original intensity. This is just the display that is saturated. If I go back to the histogram here, you see exactly what I was saying previously. Oops, oops. 
the histogram is an image. So I click on the histogram. This is, if I do this, you see that I'm changing the display of the histogram. Yes, the histogram is an image. So this is not at all what we wanted to do. So I reset, reset the display. I click on the image from which I'm drawing the live histogram. And you see that if I'm saturating, I've got some indications about who is saturated, who is displayed as saturated. You see that if I do something like that, any pixels, pixel having an intensity above this will be displayed as white. Okay. Good. So, ah, good. The problem is on this specific image, uh, in a way, I've got three populations uh, of pixels. I've got background, I've got the low intensity cells, and I've got the high intensity cells. So by tweaking the maximum, or uh, yeah, in, in that case, the maximum, by tweaking it, I will be able to see, to display the low intensity cells, but it will have a price. This price is saturating totally the high intensity cells. This is due to the fact that I'm using a linear scale to distribute the display uh, over the, the different intensities. So when I reach the limit, I will saturate some, some pixels. There are ways to enhance uh, in a different way the low, uh, the low intensity pixels as compared to the high intensity pixels. But in that case, instead of using a simple line to make the correspondence between intensities and display, I will need to use other, uh, other shapes or other geometrical shapes. And I will show you one example uh, of that. Okay, back to the drawing. Maybe I will try with a, a, different, a different color. So, uh, to solve my problem of having background, low intensity, high intensity, and being able to see the three of the same uh, the same image, what I should do is I should instead of having this. Okay, it won't work. Instead of having the low intensities over a short display range, I should try to have, let's say, a high intensity range. Okay, this displayed on a large range. The problem is, if I continue the line, it will go over the white limit. Yeah, but if I treat some kind of inflection point here, and I limit so that the maximum becomes white, then maybe I've got a way to solve the issue. The problem is putting an inflection point is something that you will see. And maybe there is a clever way to, uh, to have a boost of contrast here while uh, lowering the contrast in this part. And there are ways using uh, some math mathematical uh, curve to have a continuous uh, continuous evolution of the contrast. And this is called the gamma. The problem with the gamma is 
to the, to the opposite of the brightness contrast, which works only on the display, the gamma is working directly on the intensities. So maybe this, if we want to test it, the good thing would be to take one image, for instance, that one where we've got bright and dim intensities. We will make sure that we don't have any region of interest above the image by clicking outside of a region of interest if we've got one. So this image, click outside the region of interest if you've got one. And now we will go to image, duplicate. We could do a window style in order to have all the images uh, well uh, assembled. And on this image, I will go to process, math, and gamma. And you see that uh, some of the function have three dot. When you've got three dots, it means that uh, it won't directly apply the processing because it will require from you to enter some parameters. So gamma is one of those uh, functions. And the value is, in fact, the, the strengths at which you want to increase the contrast in the low intensity level. Preview. So you see with the with this value or with the lower value, you will enhance the contrast here of the low intensity cells without having much saturation unless you already have saturation on the original image. In general, for microscopy images, we use 0.5. This is, a, this is fine. If you use one, one is just the flat line. If you use a value over one, well, you will do the opposite out, uh, 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 to, to what you wanted to do. So 0.5. Of course, here, if I press OK, I will have lost the in original intensities because I would have applied the mathematical uh, formula to the, the full image. So, this situation is for gamma below 1. The black line here would be gamma equals 1. And this situation is for gamma above one. You will totally lose the contrast you had on low intensities and boost the contrast in the high intensities range. Okay. 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 I will close this image. And now the thing I will do is I will uh, show you one additional thing. Uh,
there are many ways to display images uh, on a on a screen, and especially when you've got several populations of uh, intensities. Uh, of course, you could use a grayscale. So. Okay, from black to white, and of course, if I use this kind of uh, of uh, scale here, I would have mid grays, and here bright uh, tones. Maybe. To be able to see this mid-range population, I will have to use tricks like the gamma transform in order to enhance the contrast and see it a bit brighter. But what about trying to, let's say, color code all the intensities? Well, hold on. It could be fun to have, let's say, the low intensities in, in blue, high intensities, let's say, in red, and yeah, it needs a bit of, uh, of, of green. This is something that we could do. Instead of using this display range, we could shape something that would be another L U T for look up table where I would split the range into three and have the three tones there. Especially if you want, you want to uh, quantify, to visually assess the, the intensity range. Uh, if you've got several ranges of your image, for instance, if you're doing some calcium imaging or things like that, using Instead of using gray scales, using lookup tables that are designed specifically to, uh, to highlight some features would be, would be a great thing. So the thing I propose is that we, we try it on one of the images, on that image. The one that we've been working on previously with the, with the gamma. So, to do that, we will simply go to Image, Color, Edit LUT. In here, the thing that you, you've got is, you've got here, the minimum, how you will display the minimum, how you will display the maximum, and how you will display in between values. At the moment, the minimum is displayed as black. If you don't want to display it as black, just click on it, and now you can edit the color, for instance, to red. You could do the same for white. Instead of having white for saturation, you may want, let's say, to have green. You could click on OK. And now if you go back to brightness and contrast, if you change the maximum, 
as you are saturating, you see that all the pixels saturated will appear as green. All the pixels that are thresholded, so below the minimum, below or equal to the minimum, will become red. So you see, by switching from this grayscale to a color table, you will visually be able to, ha to, 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 to see ranges, to see some phenomena that would be quite hard to apprehend only by using grayscale. Is it okay for everyone? Did you manage to play with the color tables to create your own color table? Still the same. I'm uh, waiting a bit because, because of the lag. So to answer your question, Josephine, you see that by using an appropriate color table, you're able, in addition to inspecting the histogram, you're able to see directly on the image where you've got saturation. And I'm pretty sure that you've been trained to the confocal systems here, and you've been using some specific color tables, and this is how they work in order to display to see, to see if you've got, uh, you've got saturation. Okay, so it seems okay, at least over the three answers that I got. So, back here. So you remember that I was proposing this color table. Okay. So, but before that, I see that I've got a, I've got a question. So, what did I do after after I did edit lookup table? The thing that I did is simply use a brightness and contrast box in order to redefine what what is my minimum displayed value and what is the maximum displayed value. Any value below the minimum will be displayed as black or in my case as i've been changing the way the first value is displayed it will be displayed as red and any value above the maximum will be displayed as previously white except that i've been changing this display to green and you see now all the saturated pixels all the pixels where the display is saturated. Is it okay? If I press on reset, then I see it's replacing the values by the minimum value within the file and the maximum value within the file, and I don't have uh, saturation. Now, the thing I could do is go back to image, color, edit LUT, and I could use the set button. Here, I could say, okay, now I want you to create a color table where I've got, let's say, three ranges. Where on each range, the, uh, the color is replicated. So scale using replication. I click on OK. And now I click on the first color, which will be blue. The second color 
will be green. And the last column will be red. So I've got the scale as I've been explaining previously. I click on OK. And now I see the different ranges. I can play now with brightness and contrast. And I will see the three ranges. So the background, the low intensity cells and the high intensity cells. I let you a few minutes to, to do it. Okay. Now, if we want to go back to the original data, the thing I, I could do is go to image, lookup tables, and grays. So, from what you see here, the all the images are quite similar. This is normal because these are exactly the same cells, except that I've got different labelings of our each image. So if one, if I want to know if all the labels are fitting or to investigate the relative position from one uh, labeling uh, to to another, the thing I could do is use color tables. Let's say try to color this specific image in red, this one in green, and this one in blue, and then overlay the three images. To color an image in, in, uh, in let's say, in, uh, in shades of blue of, or of green, in that case, the thing I could do is go back to image, color, Edit LUT. In that case, I would have to click on the first pixel and while letting it clicked, I would have to go down to the white pixel, release, define the first shade. In my case, it would be black. The last shade, in that case, I would rather go for green. And you see that it would do a gradient from black to green. This is one way to proceed, especially if I want a specific shade. But if I want regular shade, the thing I could do is simply go to image, lookup table, and for instance, blue. Now, if I want to overlay all the images, the thing I would do is go to image, color, merge channels. Here, I would first click Create Composite. Select, click also on Ignore Source LUTs because we already have been applying some 
uh, color tables, we don't want uh, to take them in, into account in here. So in red, I would go for the first image, green, let's say second image, blue, third image. I press on OK, and here it is. I've got the three images that are overlaid. As compared to previously, I, I have new information here. C, one out of three, and I've got a slider here. This means that I'm, uh, I'm currently working on channel number one out of three. I see that the labeling is in red, the outline is in red, and if I go to brightness and contrast, I see that the histogram is in, in red. If I switch to the second channel, the lettering is in green, the outline in green, and the histogram is in green as well. But when moving from one channel to another, nothing happens. The display is not changed and I'm not selecting one channel relative to the other. I'm just, well, in fact, I'm just selecting the channel so that I can work on it. For instance, if I still have brightness and contrast open, I could boost this the contrast of this specific image, not on the full, uh, on the full overlay. Is it okay for everyone? So, if this is okay for everyone, uh, the first thing we will do is we will file save as. We could save it as TIFF. This is one way to proceed. But I told you about ZIP, which is quite efficient, especially if we've got a uniform black background which is almost the case here. So I will go for zip, but just this is a, you could go for, for TIFF. Don't go for JPEG. We'll go for zip. Save it because we will reuse it uh, a bit later. So what you've got here, with three channels where this container where you can navigate from one channel to another is called a composite. And there is a nice thing here in image, color, which is called channels tool. With this tool, you're able to activate the display of one channel or another so that you can combine two, two, only two channels. If you've got a doubt about how they are, the cells are labeled and so on, this is a good way to inspect the, the different channels. This is also good because you can change the lookup tables that you've been using. For instance, especially if your colleagues are colorblind, you don't want to use red, green, and blue. You would rather use magenta, yellow, and cyan. And so if I want to switch from red to magenta, the only thing I've got to do is select the channel, go to more, and here I've got a restricted li list as compared to the big lookup table list that I, I displayed earlier. And I can choose magenta. Now I can switch to the green channel, the second channel, switch to yellow. And finally switch from blue to cyan. And of course, you see that depending on 
which color table you're using, the message does not look uh, always uh, the same. So do we have questions so far? So if we don't have questions, or if you've got questions, just put them in the chat. Now, the thing I will do is uh, propose that we make a short break and come back at 11 sharp. Do not hesitate during the break to put questions in the chat. I will first enter them, and then we will go a bit further to see how we can assemble uh, several images into into a, a nice uh, nice slide. Okay, so uh, seven minute break. <laughs> Now, I see, I see that we need a, a tiny little replay uh, for the previous uh, exercise. So, I reopen. I reopen. Uh, the image, black and white image. And so to do the three colors color table, the thing I'm doing is going to image, color, and edit LUT. From there, I will press the set button and say that I've got three colors. And here, the thing I want to do is replicate the colors. I press on OK. Select the first color as blue. Select the second color as green. and the third color as red. If I press on OK, then this is, this is what I get. Now, I need to use a brightness and contrast box in order to reset what I call maximum. And depending on where I put the maximum, then the first third of the range between the minimum that I set and the maximum that I set, the first third will be colored in blue, the second third in green, and the last third in red. Does this answer your question, Josephine? If it's not doing what you precisely wanted, it might be because when editing the loot and setting here, you've been setting maybe three and maybe using either interpolation or spline fitting. When doing this, so blue, green and red. When doing this, in, instead of replicating the intensities, it will generate a gradient. In fact, it will generate three gradients. If I go to color edit, you will see a, gra a first gradient from blue to green, 
then a second from green to red, and the last one from uh, uh, blue to green, and the last one from green to red. So you see that depending on, on the way you set the display in terms of simple gray levels playing with the histogram or in terms of colors playing with the, the lookup tables, the same data might be displayed in different ways. So it is your role to, uh, to, to think about what you want to show and depending on what you want to show, what is the most pertinent information to show, uh, you will adopt one display or another. Here, by using this kind of method, the thing you want to show is different ranges of intensities. And you want to make it easier for the reader to interpret the data. Here you see directly the three ranges of intensities of, uh, of interest. So. Uh, no intensity or background, low intensity and high intensities. And just by looking at it, it's quite easy to interpret if you compare to the original data that I could get back by going to image, lookup table and grades. If what is interesting for you is to see where you've got an overlap or where you've got, let's say, spatial relationship between signals, it might be worth going for this kind of display where you take the different channels, you, you attribute to each channel a certain color table and you overlay the, the different channels. So what is the difference between LUT editor and RGB image? Hmm, good question. Okay. So, question from Elise. Okay. So, here, when you've got a composite image, you, you have, in fact, a collection of three images, three grayscale images. You can tell by here the indication that this is a 16-bit uh, image. But to each, for each uh, grayscale image, you have associated um, a color table. So meaning that everything is displayed in color. But the pure nature of the image is a black, a series of black and white images, plus uh, uh, this reference table that will convert the intensities into displayed colors. If I go to image, type, RGB color, the thing I will do on the composite is transform this image that is in color, that is displayed in color, in another type of image container. This image container is a color image. You see, now, although if I put them side by side, I can't, I can't really tell from their look who is who. I see that here I still have on the composite image 16-bit, whereas here I've got RGB. When I, I go over the image, if I look at the status bar from image A, I see that I've got three coordinates, in fact four, X, Y, Z, and the value. If I go on the other image, I see that I've got two the x, y coordinates plus under the value, I've got three values. One for the red, one for the amount of green, the other one for the amount of blue. All the three values, you can go over all the pixels, you won't find any value that is higher than 255. In fact, an RGB image, a color image, is composed of three channels, each channel uh, being of a depth of eight bits. So you've got a first channel that will automatically and always be uh, encoded in 
in red. This first channel will be in A bit, second channel in green, A bit, and third channel in blue, A bit. So you see that you have lost part of the information because now you've got one, one red, one green, and one blue channel, each one being in A bit. So there is an additional problem. And instead of, um, instead of proposing an exercise, I will simply show the problem to you by creating a synthetic image. So don't do it, just have a look at what I'm doing. So new image, I'm creating a new image, okay. With this shape, I'm creating a new image. Oops. Okay, these three images, I could overlay them. So you see, I've got some cyan, some magenta, and some yellow. All is overlaid. Now I could transform this image in color into a color image. I don't see much of a difference, except that here I've been representing this data using three channels, red, green, and blue. The thing I could do is try here to separate the three channels, the red, the green, and the blue. And you see that it's not at all the same as previously. Red, the red channel is not only one circle, it's one, two circles. The green is not only one circle, it's the circle plus the square, etc. And this is due to the fact that to encode the cyan or to encode the magenta, the magenta is red and blue, equal amount of red and equal amount of blue. Uh, this one is equal amount of green and blue, etc., etc. So you see that to encode exactly the same message using a referential where I've got only access to red, green, and blue. I should spread the information from here into two channels, into the blue channel and into the green channel. Whereas here, by using a composite, so an image in color, I keep the original nature of each channel. Does this answer your question? And the additional problem is uh, here, I've been reducing the range. I've been downsampling uh, the possible intensities coming from a 16-bit scale and crushing it into, into 8 bits. So making some assumptions, grouping some intensities between them. So I've been losing resolution in terms of intensities. Okay. So I don't see any uh, I don't see any additional uh, questions or comments. So in that case, in that case, the thing I will do is close all the images. To do that, file and close all.
Okay. Good. Now. Now that we have seen all the things to tweak a bit the display of our images, uh, the thing I propose is from, from the image that we've been playing with, we will generate uh, a figure. And basically, the thing I, I want to end up with is something like that, a figure where I would have, let's say, on the top, I would have the, let's say, red, green, and blue channels, maybe uh, all displayed in gray levels. And then I would have the overlay at the end. So I surely have uh, cells here. And the thing I would like is uh, on the bottom part, let's say, okay, and maybe uh, one cell here. The thing I would like to have is take a region of interest only on one and display the overlay here. And same here, have an overlay of, let's say, a different part of the, of the cell. Of course, the thing I want to have is lettering. So that I've got a nice figure to put in my repo. Okay, so this is the kind of thing that we could do with different softwares, such as uh, Illustrator, Adobe Illustrator, and so on. But this is a good opportunity to show you that some functions, there are some additional functions for the image software that are not installed, but that are available. So we will see how to install what is called a plugin for the, the image software. Uh, the thing we will do is all together, we will first go through the installation of one uh, specific plugin, which is figure J. And once we will have done this, I will show you how to do it. So in demo mode, so just giving you some hints about how to use it. And then I will leave you some time to play with it on your own and ask questions in, uh, in, the, in the chat. First, let's install the figure J plugin. To do that, you will need to go back to figure J in the help menu and go to update the at the ready bottom of the of the menu. So it's always taking a bit of time, just checking that uh, everything is well up to date. And this is in the update that we will also be able to add additional functions. There is a lot to check currently. Okay. Now, in the bottom of this window, we will have to manage update sites, saying to ImageA to have a look at different update sites at modifications of uh, additional update sites. So scroll down the list, and you've got to check this box, which is IBMP CNRS, IBMP.
you will have also to find the image science line and to tick the box. So IBMP image science. Once it's done, you simply close this window and then you press the apply changes button on the previous window. On your side, you should see new stuff like like figure J and image science uh, within the, within this uh, this window. Press apply changes, and it will download the required files. And once it's done, you can click on OK. You're invited to restart Figure J, so close it and restart it. So, is it okay for everyone? Did you manage to install Figure J? So, I consider that you didn't have any major issues. So, to check that you indeed have uh, Figure J uh, installed, you would go to Plugins and check if you've got this uh, Figure J menu here. Okay, so it's being <laughs> downloaded. Okay. So waiting uh, still a bit. So as I told you, uh, just put the download aside wait for it to, to complete. The thing I will show you is how to use Figure J. So you don't have to follow along. Okay, so not yet, okay. So you, you just have to follow along. This will uh, allow time for the download and, and so on. And just get a grasp at how, how it works. So I will start Figure J by simply going to Plugins, Figure J, and Start Figure J. This will open this small little box where I've got some options that will be useful once we uh, uh, once we have a, a template, a layout for our figure. So on the top, I will create a new figure. And I can already set the final dimensions of my figure. So in my case, it will be 10 centimeters per 10 centimeters with a resolution of 300 dots per inch. I click on OK, and now I've got an empty layout. And as I was explaining earlier, this is what I want to, to get. So this is at that precise step that uh, I will define the, the layout. So I've got two, I want two lines. So I will use the split option here. So I will make two boxes splitted uh, with the horizontal line. 
on the top, I wanted four, uh, four columns. So I select four and I split vertically. On the lower panel, which I click on to activate it, I will go to two and split. So I see that some of you have uh, problems installing, etc. Uh, first, the thing I will do is complete this demo, and then we will go back to uh, the installation process. So here, well, the thing I could do is reshape a bit to have something like that to be closer to what my plan was. Now, the, now that I've got the layout, uh, I won't change anything in the layout because otherwise I will uh, totally kill my, uh, my figure. Now the thing, uh, so you must think about the layout before adding images in the different parts of the, the, the layout. So now the thing I will do is click on the first box and I will import the image I want to include there. To do that, I click on the, on the first and then I will uh, assign or reopen an image. And this is where I will point at the composite image I've been saving earlier. So I've got the image on which I have this selection uh, tool here. I can reshape the tool, but the global shape will always be uh, same as the on the, the the box on the on the layout. I can use the handle here to tilt my selection knowing that the blue line here corresponds to what will be on the top of the of the of the of the box in the final image so let's assume that this is the place uh, where i want to make the selection okay i said previously that what i wanted here is only the first channel then second channel then third channel then the overlay what I will need here is to modify the display so that I've got only one channel. And as you may have seen, when opening the, the composite, it has been opening the channel tools, channel tools that we've been using earlier. So what I need is only channel one. And to be honest, if I keep the color table in red, this won't be really well visible on the image. This is why instead of using the composite display, I will go for grayscale here, something that we haven't seen yet. But this allows me to display only one channel at a time, but in grayscale. So channel one, grayscale, I'm done. I'm clicking on OK here. It will automatically incorporate the, the snapshot into the figure. Now, I would like exactly the same position, exactly the same uh, selection in all the three other uh, boxes. So the thing I will do is click on the first box and I will copy, but copy from the figure J toolbox. So copy, select the other uh, box, and now I will paste. Don't go for copying and pasting the regular way you've got to use the buttons there so you see that it will recall the box the position of the box i will only have to tweak a bit the display to be in grayscale and select channel 2. now i click on ok and i will do exactly the same so paste grayscale and channel number three 
here, select, paste. This way, I want the overlay to be displayed in the last column. So, composite, and I activate the three channels. Okay. Now, for the two bottom parts, if I paste, you see that the aspect ratio is not the same between the two boxes. So it will generate some issues. If I want to have uh, a different view, a zoomed view from the same image, unfortunately, the thing I will have to do is reopen the original image. So I will have to assign or reopen the image, select again the composite, and now play with the box Let's say focusing here. And now do exactly the same for that one. The sign, reopen, composite, open. And that's it. Now, the only thing that I need to do is decorate this figure. So I will use a decorate button. Here, I can select where I want the ABC labels to be placed. So top left, left seems okay. And I want ABC. That's it, I'm, I'm done. So unfortunately, I didn't thought about calibrating the image, but if your image is calibrated, you could here add a scale bar and show the value. So here it's not calibrated, meaning that I will have okay, 100 pixels, which doesn't mean much, except that if I do exactly the same here, I will see I will see that it makes the difference between the two. It has uh, in mind the difference of the difference of scale between the two zooms that I've been doing on uh, on the image. The final thing, oops, decorate I and tick because okay. But with the images that we will be acquiring on the facility, everything will be calibrated already. So you will just have to tick the scale bar and it will, it will fit perfectly uh, with, the, with the, your data. So the last thing to do once you have done the figure is to save it. So click on save here. It will, add, so on a Mac, you don't have, at least on my version of Fiji, you don't have the indications on top, but it would ask for a folder in where to save the data. So I will save it on the desktop, create a new folder, which I will call figure. Open it and it will save a lot of things in this folder. Basically in the folder, it will save the original data, the figure J file, which is the one you can reopen with figure J if you want to work on the image. You will have the full resolution figure as a TIFF file uh, on which you can zoom quite well, quite heavily. This is really the full resolution. And you've got the JPEG compressed figure. And if you start zooming at it, at some point, you may end up with uh, the texture that you would find on any JPEG file small blocks of 8 by 8 or 16 by 16 pixels. Is it okay for the general principle? Okay, so now, oops, not that one, that one. Okay, so in the comment, 
Can you show the way again? Okay, about installing. Okay. About installing, we went for... Oops. Help. And... Update. It's checking a lot of stuff. Okay. Okay. Then, when they, once it's displayed, you go to Manage Update Sites. And in fact, you've got to scroll down the list and tick IBMP CNRS. And tick Image Science. So once you've ticked the two, then you close this, this window and you press the apply changes that in your case might not be grayed. It will do all the down downloading, etc., the installation work. Then you will have a pop-up window asking you to restart ImageJ. So you restart the software and you should be good to go. Is it okay for Elise? Okay, in the meantime, I will answer to Quentin. So, about the fonts, when you go to decorate, well, when you go to decorate, you don't have, uh, in the new version, you don't have any more the, the option, but I will show you how to, to do it. Uh, so, you go to edit in uh, Fiji, options, and fonts. So here I will go for that one, maybe in bold to see, and maybe change the size. It will be ugly, but okay. And now I need to update the letters and so on. So the thing I will do is I will select known in the panel label. And then I will go back to ABC. And this is done. For the scale bar, okay, I will have this. And if I want specifically to update the scale bar, then the thing I need to do is select a different font, untick the show value, and retick show value. But be careful if you if you change again the labels, this is a new font that will be considered. So okay. Good. Good, good. So the thing I propose is um, I let you let's say 10 minutes to try to build a figure on your own. And uh, in uh, in ten minutes, in ten minutes, uh, then I will uh, reactivate the chat and so on. See if you've got questions. And this way, we will we will end 
just right in time at uh, noon uh, with by the 10 last minutes of, uh, of questions. Okay, so see you in 10 minutes. Have fun with uh, Figure J. Hey, we'll restart. So, did you manage to uh, create uh, a figure? Did you have troubles creating figures? Just let me know in the in the comments. So, did he, if you manage to uh, to create the figure, just uh, say yes in the in the chat so that I I know. If you've got questions, uh, same. Just uh, just put them in into into the chat, and uh, so I've been told that some of you are living quite uh, a bit away from uh, the spots where you will have the practicals so this is why I've been asked to finish uh, at 12 so once so the, the really last we are in the really last 10 minutes of the of this uh, this lecture and so I will answer your questions and uh, once done, we will uh, have uh, this session uh, finished for for today. So, for the ones that are not commenting, uh, not putting uh, anything in the chat, did it work or or not? Okay. Uh, is it possible to reopen the figure and change how the different frames are organized, changing images, etc.? Is it possible to draw a square to multiply the region of zoom? Okay. So, first question is it possible to reopen the figure, etc.? Uh, let's say that I want to reopen my figure. I could simply click on open and click on the figure J file. And everything should be done quite easily. Then if I want, for instance, to change this uh, specific uh, view, uh, I could double click on the image, it will reopen exactly the same image. And I could, for instance, choose something else, modify it, and then include it. This is this is the first, first uh, level. Second level, if I want to change the image, the thing I will have to do is first click on the image on the on, on the small box. I will have to clear remove this image and then assign a new image there. I, I won't do it. Okay. But I would have to uh, reassign. Then if the question is, uh, can I change 
the general shape. If I change the general shape, you see that it will uh, give some troubles because the snapshot that have been done and will um, resize and, and so on are not well reside, resized anymore. So if I double click on one panel, I will have to reassign precisely, but with the new shape. Okay, and of course, it, if I want exactly the same panel here and here and here, I will have to first clear, 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 and then reuse the copy and paste technique. And so I hope this answers your question. Uh, change how the different frames are organized. So I think this, this should answer the, your question, Silva. Now, is it possible to draw a square to notify the regions, the region of the zoom? I must say that there are new tools here, but I'm not sure that this is, uh, this is what they actually do. Uh, to be honest, uh, the thing that I, uh, I would rather do it in a di different way. So the thing I would do is, oops, sorry. I would open the uh, original image. Maybe place the rectangular region. Use edit draw to draw on the original image the the square save this oops sorry i've been saving it in the, on the wrong place And then, so I will do a quick, uh, then the thing I would do is, of course, open the modified image. And then in the squares below, I will reopen the image. And now use, use the square that I've placed in order to target the region of interest. that way so it's it's not perfect but it's a trick to go around i hope this answers the the question uh, madu okay simple. i've tried i tried it uh, but i don't know why but i can't select the different parts of the figure okay so when you draw something or when you use the tools uh, when you use the tools from image, you will see that you will be able to, for instance, draw on your figure, but you won't be able to select the panel. In that case, make sure that you've got this tool here, the colorful tool at the end of the toolbar, that you've got it selected. Press it, and now you will find 
uh, that you're able to select each single panel. So for Silva, this should be uh, this should do the, the, the trick. Okay, so last chance for a few questions, maybe. Okay, so if you don't have any uh, additional questions, uh, I think we will end this session and. Uh, Basically, tomorrow we'll see how we can process the images with uh, filters and so on in order to prepare the analysis of your data. And by analysis, we mean uh, maybe count the number of objects you've got on an image, maybe for each object, extract some parameters like the area, the length, the perimeter, the, uh, the int intensity and, uh, and, and so on. So we will do this uh, mainly on 2D images, still with, uh, with Fiji and uh, with some of the data that uh, you've been down downloading. So I hope that this uh, short session, this short introduction has been uh, useful uh, for, for, for what you're doing currently in the labs and uh, on the facility. And uh, I think, uh, this is the end of the, this session, and I I say uh, goodbye and uh, see you tomorrow for the next step. So image analysis with figure J, uh, with image. J. Sorry. Okay. Bye.